Welcome back. It's live in color here with AD, my man Hudson. We got our different What's camera happening? angles once again. So back with another podcast today. Got a special guest right here, Stu Frick. Hello. Artist that made this jacket. Super yeah. dope. So we're going to get into that. We're going to get into a whole bunch of important, interesting stuff today. But before we get started, I'm going to just need you all to follow us on Instagram, Live and in Color Media, Twitter, It's Live and Color. And make sure you follow us uh, on YouTube, like subscribe, like, comment, all that stuff. And we got the special link now, it's youtube.com slash live and color. Super cool. Super cool. <laughs> we out here. So make sure you follow us on that. But yeah, now let's get to our guests. How you doing, Stu? Yo, I'm doing quite well, man. Busy day, but I'm glad I get to just relax here now. Just talk a little bit. It's nice. So I see this fit you're rocking right now, and I must say it's pretty flea. Thank you, thank you. I I, I had a, I had a tall order because I was coming here straight from work, so yeah. I was like, all right, what can I wear to work, and then I can wear to film this, and the, you know, because like it's always a lot of pressure. Yeah. Whenever you're like going to something and they're like, hey, we want to talk to you because of your clothes, and it's like, fuck, I can't. I just... gotta show up. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Which like thankfully is it was like half my goal with doing yeah. this is just giving myself excuses to dress up wherever I go. <laughs> uh, like but that. yeah, I, ju I just wore this whole thing to work and then swapped the shirt so that I had something painted on, you know, have a little necklace that my girlfriend's mom gave me for Christmas. I just got this belt from a uh, Three Pigs Collective. Uh, definitely check out Three Pigs Collective. They're the best vintage store in the whole city, hands down. I gotta say that the necklace fits the fit, uh, fit perfectly. Like, yeah, I, really yeah. Like the I, I was wearing out. this whenever I went to get the belt, and yeah. I was looking at because I want. I've been wanting to get like a metal belt for a bit, just because yeah. I like like sparkly shit. And I like saw the one with the tassel, and I was like, "Yo, it's per I, like just tassels all the way down." I'm gonna get some like western tassels, <laughs> yeah, because I, I already have some pants with tassels on them. Eventually, I'm just gonna get like shoe tassels, hat, like it's all gonna be tassels, 100. percent Nah, I like it. It's flea. It's flea. Thank you. So um, now our audience doesn't know you as well as we do, so let's just go through a couple things, you know, let them mm -hmm. know about you. So um, when did you start getting into fashion? I mean, when I. Are, are are we talking like when I started making clothes or when I got into fashion? Because very different. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I guess, but let's touch on both then. All right. So the first time I ever got into fashion was playing NFL Street Two. Yeah, that was my game. <laughs> yep that that shit was so good. Me and my brother would play that endlessly. And on, on like the make a team, you can customize everyone's outfits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I was I just started putting like hours and hours into just customizing outfits. And I would like. I had like a really good team built up and then I started doing their outfits and I realized I didn't like the color scheme and I like scrapped the whole thing because I was like, this is bullshit. Yeah, I got to do I something with the light blue in it. Started playing as the sharks and shit. Because I, I like growing up, I grew up in like a uh, really like religious family and like all scientists, like no, nobody in my family particularly cares about the arts necessarily. Yeah. Like not that they have disdain for it or anything, but like. You know, m nobody in my family would, like, make fun of me for dressing poorly yeah, yeah. or really, like, uh, celebrate you for dressing that well. So it was just never something that, like, occurred to me until I had that, like, first bit of influx. And then, you know, I, I started wearing terrible outfits in high school and experimenting and then, like, finding myself in college. And, yeah. and eventually I, I first started painting clothes back in 2016. Um because I'm, I'm really into Bob Ross. Yeah. I, I would watch Bob Ross videos all the time on YouTube to fall asleep. And one of my friends in college got me, like, a starter painting kit that was, like, Bob Ross. So that, like, I could paint along with a Bob Ross video for Christmas one year. And I, so, but I, like, never used it. I had it in my closet for a long time. Yeah. Then in 2016, 
I missed uh, a Julian Baker show, who's like one of my favorite musicians, or at least was at the time. I haven't kept up with them as much, but uh, I like missed their show and was really bummed because I wanted to get some of the merch. So I like looked up, I, I don't know, just like some kind of little spark was like, wait, like, I wonder if I can just paint on something yeah. that I have. And so I like looked up fabric paint, went and bought some, and then painted my first shirt. And like, it was the best feeling ever to get done with something, even though it was terrible. It was like, oh shit, like I made this and nobody else has this now. Yeah. Because I was working at Forever 21 at the time. So like everybody was wearing the same things all the time. You always see people wearing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So it was really, it was really cool to have something that was like my own. And I just kept expounding on that and expounding on that. And here we are. Like, one of the things that I feel is just, like, a lot of people just wear those name brands and stuff, and, yeah, they hold weight, but, like, something I've realized over time is just, like, wearing, like, I, I personally wear things, like, that support, like, rappers I know, like, people I know, like, people I've met and things like that. Like, I'd rather put my money in their pocket and support their message and then rep them outside than wear, like, Forever 21 or, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, I mean, aside from all the, like, Forever 21 is just a fucking terrible company. I hate them. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're awful. But, like, yeah, yeah, it, it, it was... It was just sort of like the realization of, you know, I had like started getting into fashion and had mostly experienced it from that very like hyper commercialized, you know, by the numbers yeah. kind of side of it. And it was it was a realization that fashion could be more than that. Fashion could be more like what I wanted it and hoped it would be. You know, because you, you, you growing up and, and sort of wanting to dress well, you have a bit of a rosy view of it. And then yeah. you start like working even just in like a retail store and you're like, oh, my God, it's all bullshit. Like, this is terrible. Yeah. And then, you know, having the ability to create something that was at least a bit, you know, special and, and unique to just me was really nice. And, and it sort of opened me up to a whole different side of the fashion world. So did you ever end up using that Bob Ross kit? Yeah, that that was the, that was the one I used for oh, the first one. For the it, first it was like, like the the brushes and the palette from it. They were like still in my closet, and that's that. Like I saw them in my closet and was like, I wonder if I could paint something on there. So that was like the first one I used. Nah, that's really cool. Yeah. So other than Bob Ross, like, what other artistic inspirations would you say that you had? I mean, like, there's like it's really hard to say because it, it's very difficult to narrow it down yeah, yeah a yeah, narrow it down that. and like differentiate between who is like whenever i'm creating art i'm thinking of them versus artists that i really like you yeah. know because like i i really like artists like uh francis bacon or like basquiat obviously and stuff like that but i don't necessarily channel them when i'm making art that much but in terms of like fashion my two biggest for sure are um, Isabel de Borsgrave, who is, she's a, uh, fuck, I want to say Dutch, but she she's a European fashion designer who uh, like paints paper and then fashions the paper into clothing. Yeah. And we use a really similar painting technique. Um, and so like, I, I really love seeing her work because she's essentially just like, a better version of me so yeah. it's very cool to see it like look at the top of the mountain and then the other one is iris van herpen uh she's the she is definitely dutch <laughs> fashion designer uh who does like the 3d printed clothes like the ones that look like water coming off of people's oh, bodies yeah, and yeah. stuff I like that yeah she she had a uh, um an exhibit at the carnegie museum of art back in like 2015 or 2016 i want to say and like that shit blew me away that because that like those two artists specifically are like those are the pinnacle of what fashion can be yeah. in my eyes I, at least like you know within my narrow view of it i'm sure that there are other amazing artists that would also exemplify that but like within what i've seen those are like the top the top so the, that's very much so what i would want to try to get to with what i'm doing so, yeah, no, obviously, big ways to go, but just in terms of your career already, you're definitely pretty set, I would say. I, no, nah, there's definitely, like, always room for improvement and everything, you know? But I would say, I uh, your name is known out here. People definitely like all the stuff that you've been doing. So, like, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment thus far? Um, uh, it's, it's weird to say, because my biggest accomplishment, like, several of my biggest accomplishments are probably going to happen this year. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, which is nice because I'm finally getting to the point where like I'm planning out projects to be further in the future and yeah. I can like actually, you know, plan and work towards them. But I mean, oh man, 
In terms of specific projects, I mean, honestly, thus far, Benji wearing my shit at the at the PBM. Pittsburgh's very own yeah. show that that was fucking nuts. And I mean, like in general, my project with Benji is like realistically gonna be the biggest thing I've done yet, and also like the most artistically satisfying thing I've done yet in terms of projects I'm I'm working on. Yeah, I'm still like wrapping my head around the fact that I'm getting to work on what I'm getting to work on. Yeah, now that jacket by Benji, that's the first thing that caught my eye actually about you. Like I saw that jacket, I was like, whoa, whoever made that, I need one. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. that was right before you hit me up yeah. for one, wasn't it? Yeah. Cause now I literally saw the jacket. I was like, wow, whoever made that, like I need a jacket, yo, that, that it, yeah. it was definitely like I mean, A, that was the biggest like audience I've been in front of. Yeah. And like yeah, I mean, I don't know. That that was the culmination of like a lot of work in many ways, both of like practicing and practicing and practicing to be able to to make something that I was comfortable with being seen on a stage like that and also the work of, you know, like slowly building up a reputation to the point that, you know, an artist of Benji's like caliber would want to work yeah. with me in general. Yeah. No, I feel that definitely. Um so just for now, we're going to head to break real quick. But um, definitely got a lot more dope conversation coming up, so stay tuned. Next section is going to be about your artistic process, so stay tuned for that. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. podcast here with Stu Frick, Sweet Tooth Customizations. What's up? I just realized I haven't been looking at the camera at all this whole time. I haven't either. <laughs> Shit. <Exactly. laughs> so um, now we're going to touch on your process and, you know, just you as an artist, how, how you go about your thing. So I don't know, however you want to start this. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, honestly, because, like, this is always an inevitable question that you get asked during yeah. interviews is like, so what, like, what's it like? And... It, uh, I never really know how to answer it because it changes every single time. Yeah, like every time, every project is a lot different. I mean, it like because a if I'm if I just like happen to have like five hours free to paint and I have you know I like keep like a so there's basically two primary sections. Either there's things that I'm like making for myself or like not for a specific order or yeah. event, and then things that I'm making like with a specific goal in mind. So for the the ones that I'm just sort of making for myself, you know, especially back whenever I was like 
practicing and and testing myself and stuff like that, I would just keep a rack of like blank clothes that were like my painting clothes. Like these are the ones I would paint on. And whenever I had the free time, you know, you just pick a random piece, not necessarily a random piece off of the rack, but kind of like flick through, find one that you think would work, then go to your paints, find things that you think would work, and just start painting. Very little planning, tra- yeah. you know, like sort of like intentionally off the cuff, essentially. Like you don't, you know, especially whenever there's, you know, there's only so much time in the day. So whenever I have time to paint, I try and not like beat around the bush and yeah. be like, oh, like, you know, what exact piece am I going to make? Because like it's, you know, it's about like just getting in there, putting paint on the clothes, fucking it up, making something terrible, and then doing it better the next time. It's always better to just be putting stuff on than be sitting there, like, agonizing over what you're going to do. But then on the other side, whenever I'm making something specific, like, you know, for your jacket that I made, that's like, okay, work out exactly what the customer or whatever the show you're doing needs for that. You know, like, what colors are going to be needed? What's the style? Everything like that. And then get the right product to paint on and those those orders are whenever i'll like sketch it out and things like that because you know if you're painting for somebody else and they're giving you money you gotta make sure that it's high quality so that's whenever you can be a little more meticulous a little more time intensive and then the time whenever you're painting alone is whenever i take the opportunity to be like a little dumber and make worse choices and just see where they go because sometimes that's you know whenever you develop a new technique or figure out a new way to apply a certain paint or use a different medium a certain way, but it's also where you, you know, ruin, like, three yeah. shirts in the process of doing that. But you that. gotta see how the how it looks, like, on actual, like, clothes. Like. It, it, yeah, exactly. Like, you, you have a lot of ideas, but yeah. you never know exactly, you know, you're like, oh, man, I wonder if I could do, like, one more layer on that. You try it out, and then you're like, no, that's too many layers. The paint is too thick, and it's going to crack and heat now. Yeah. Things like that. And then once you have those down in the practice section, you can apply them towards, like, custom orders and things like that. So, like, this is this something that you, like, pre-printed, like, just off the dome? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, for one thing, like, this type of dress shirt yeah. is really easy to find at thrift stores. Yeah. So I would just go to thrift stores buy a bunch of these dress shirts and it's also relatively quick to paint on like things like denim yeah. take forever because you have to multi-layer or put paint on really thick or use like specific mediums to make sure that it can hold up to weather and washing and things like that but yeah. this stuff it you know it like ends up like the more like um like sleek materials that aren't yeah. as absorbent you can paint on them quicker and do like fun designs faster like this but it'll be a little less uh, like durable and stuff like that. So that this is very much so one where I was just like, got a couple hours in the evening, let's go crazy, yeah. you know, like get a beer and just paint some stuff for a little while. No, that sounds like a good night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that's how I prefer to spend my nights. If I had my choice, I would like never go out again. So um, you talked about like two scenarios, basically like one is the free form, like, and then the second is like working with the customer on an idea. Mm-hmm. And like, I know in your free form, you definitely have a lot more uh, creative control in that. But I was just wondering, which do you like doing more? Like, do you like collabing with other people or are you like kind of uh, solo and then see how that comes? I mean, like, it, it really depends, like, because, well, A, for one thing, collabs give you money you know whenever you're just making stuff on your own you're like maybe i'll sell this eventually but you're you know pretty much making it for yourself or you know for to like put up on your website at some point and stuff like that but so so i mean in in some ways the i I i wouldn't really say that i have a preference between one or the other in a general sense but within like specifications within them my favorite is collaborating with another artist on a specific piece where I'm you, there's like a, a really nice like Goldilocks balance sometimes where you're working with someone and you're still given creative control but you're making it custom for them whether it's I like a that, friend yeah. or you know like another artist but my, my favorite is musicians whenever it's like I'm making a synesthesia piece based off their music. So I I have, like, a specific goal in mind, and it's, like, going to someone. It isn't just, like, getting hung hung back up on my rack. But I still get to, like, play around and have fun and sort of experiment with the techniques I've developed before. Those are my favorite whenever I get to make pieces based off of music, for sure. So, um... On that note, let's talk about the Benji. Hey, <laughs> yeah. I'm really good at segues. <laughs> yeah, definitely. 
But yeah, not nah, so just that first jacket. I know we'll talk about that music video in a little bit because yeah. I know you did the styling for that and that was super dope. But um, first, I just want to talk about how that collab with the jacket, the first jacket that he wore at the Pittsburgh's very own, this one right here on screen. Yep. yep. <laughs> so, oh, man, that was a fun night. That was a great night. I was drunk as shit for when he came out. I oh man, that was so much fun. Me and my me and my girlfriend were like crying together. It was the best. Everyone showed out that Woo! night. Like that, that night yeah, was great. Yeah, man. That yeah, that, yo, that show place. was so good. Yeah. Like whatever, like Pittsburgh has to show up like that for everything. everything. Yeah, I feel everything. That. And honestly, there has been a decent amount of momentum, I feel like, coming off of that. Like even even to artists that like weren't directly associated with those shows. I'm like seeing more people show out. I'm I'm you know, like like I feel like everybody is kind of realizing the enthusiasm there is for the scene right now. Like, Britney Chantel just had her album release party, and that shit was fucking popping. And it's like, all of these artists are are killing it right now, and people are catching on. It's I, about time, yeah. Exactly. I'm like, finally, here we go. What was but, that one house show we went to? Uh, Bossing Say. We were at a Bossing yeah, Say show the other night. I love Bossing Say. Where the fuck is Bossing Say? <laughs> <laughs> that's the question. Weird. It was. It was a weird. It was hard to find. Was no, that's the no, point. No, I'm kidding. I, yeah, that's yeah, the point. yeah. I feel stupid. Now. You never no, know. Yeah, what yeah, the yeah. But um, now nah, we saw this dude Infinite Third and like yes. crazy experience. Yo, he sat down. He had like all his mixing boards out, and then he had his guitar, mm -hmm. and he would just play like a quarter or two, record that, then play another quarter. Oh two, man, I that. fucking love looping artists. Yeah. That shit, I like mm -hmm. that's hard. I love that shit. Shout out Infinite Third for the follow back Definite. on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> hey, I haven't I haven't listened to them yet. I'll have to check them out. Nah, it's just one guy. Uh, he, Billy Mays. He goes by He's really. Yeah. Yeah. Infinite. Billy Mays the third or something. Infinite like that. third is the. I think it's Twitter name. Yeah, but Billy okay. Mays just people call him that. I guess he looks like Billy Mays a little bit, like from uh, the OxyClean commercial. All right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nah, yeah, he was super dope watching him. But yeah, back, back to the Benji. So yeah, how did that uh, collab come about? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know how many details I can go Give into out, yeah, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. But I, I will say, so I'm, I'm doing the. The jackets is part of like a larger project surrounding his album. I'm doing a jacket for each song on the upcoming album that he's putting out this year. Um, yeah, yeah. If you didn't hear it yet, we, I, I've talked about it a couple times before. Yeah. But um, yeah, so essentially, I have synesthesia. I don't know who who all is familiar with that. But in case you aren't, it's a mental pheno phenomenon where your uh, sensory inputs will overlap occasionally. Uh, my variety is chromesthesia, which is the most common one, where occasionally you'll pretty much see sounds is like the easiest way to break it down. Wow. So whenever I listen to music, occasionally when I'm hearing people's voices and like sometimes just like general environmental noises, will create like colorways and like patterns and shapes in my field of vision. Um, and I've done a couple like smaller collaborations with artists before, excuse me. And, uh, I essentially got linked up with Benji because I did the, the first like piece I ever promoted with that, with, like that was a synesthesia piece was based off of Mimosa yeah. way back in the day. And he bought it off me. I just like put it on Twitter. A couple people liked it and he hit me up and was like, this is really tight. Can I buy it? Which is like awesome. Cause yeah. like. I don't know, man. When it, like whatever people are just willing to buy art that was inspired by their art, it, you know, it was it was a lot of it was a very uh, a lot of respect in that situation mutually between us. But we got linked up and started working on the album jackets together a little bit before that show. And then like as the show was coming up, I was like making the jacket for his favorite song on the album, which is the one that he wore that night. Yeah, that's like based on one of the tracks. And, like, I, d I didn't want to, like, assume that he would want to wear it. But, like, in the week leading up, I was like, hey, in case you were interested, I'm going to have this done by Thursday. And he was like, fuck yeah, let's go. Like, I'm wearing it for the show. But yeah. So that was how that came about. And that, that project is still ongoing. Uh, you'll be seeing more of that soon. A lot more of that soon. We have, we have some big things planned for that. I so saw you had a GoFundMe uh, to bring his band to Tennessee, by the way. I think yeah. they hit their goal, but you should donate to that, obviously. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't donated to the GoFundMe yet, definitely do so. Yeah. And follow him on everything. Avatar Benji. Super dope artist. But yeah, nah, his uh, newest music video, so I'm guessing that featured some of the other jackets from the... Um, yeah, so uh, that one, is, that was... 
I'm trying to think of how to format this. Hushin, yeah, you so, want to pull up that music video real quick? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Just so, yeah. Keep talking while I look at it. Yeah, so basically... So that, that was done by uh, a videographer, Dean Bogg, that we're working with on the project as well. Yeah. We're, we're doing like a three-pronged project. That's pretty much all I can say about it right now. You know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they were doing a music video and... I was just like, do you guys need a wardrobe? And they were like, oh, fuck yeah. So I was like, let's go. And I brought in a bunch of jackets. Funnily enough, though, that outfit, I brought the pants for that. But other than that, everything else Benji owned. The other jacket that's on top is a different jacket of mine that he bought, like, earlier last year as well. I did it for a Reviving Reel, uh, like, playlist that they put out. And he bought that one, too. So, yeah, I don't don't know. It was just perfect. I mean, honestly, like... I was really excited to be a part of that video, but I can't really take much credit for it. Like, Dean fucking killed it. He nailed that shit. I was I was definitely, like, out of the three of us, I was the least involved in the success of that. No, but the style definitely pops. Like, I'll say that, like, throughout the whole video, that, like, his clothes caught my eye. So, like, yeah, yeah. it definitely stood out. Just the entire production as a whole on this project, all three of you came together, and I feel like it really stood out. So if you haven't checked out this video, make sure you do. Yeah, check it out. It was featured on a uh, lyrical lemonade too. Yeah, they did write a lyrical. Nuts. Yeah, bro, that's super <laughs> dope, dog. Uh, man, like all of the. Oh man, it's fucking crazy. Just to like, just to be working with Benji is crazy. To to, like, see the amount of like, success and respect that he's seeing yeah. right now, and then be like essentially welcomed in to work alongside with him in that success is like a crazy honor so thanks benji shout out benji man shout make sure benji. you check it out <laughs> and lyrical lemonade wrote about him so you know it's not anybody like you should sleep on man you got to be on top of this you got to check it out yeah man follow him on everything. get it now before the ticket prices go up you know true 100 percent so um just going back to i i guess this touches on what we were talking about before about the nfl street and you getting into fashion yeah but um just why I decided to paint clothes instead of on canvas? Um, I mean, like, so part of it was, all right, I'm, to be totally real, essentially, I'm not that good of an artist. Like, I never went to art school. I never, you know, I took, like, art classes in high school. That was about it. Yeah. The, the most I did, I was a nude model at IUP for, like, painting classes, and that was the closest I ever got. And I never, I never like, practiced painting or anything like that. So whenever I, I like, started getting interested in fashion and, uh, you know, like, creating clothes and everything like that, I... I, w- I was, like, simultaneously building up these two interests in fashion and painting, you know, like, looking at more paintings, going to more museums, uh, you know, like, consuming that art form more, but simultaneously just being, like, overwhelmingly um, intimidated by the art form itself, you know? There, yeah. There's, like, a lot of very, very high levels of skill associated with painting, and obviously some, like, some paintings don't, necessarily require like technical skill that's not what art is about you know it isn't just about who can paint the most photorealistic portrait that's not what makes it good but regardless it definitely is like a a mental barrier to entry of like oh i've never painted anything before i'm just going to start painting canvases and they'll be in a museum you know that like that seems pretty unrealistic and probably wouldn't have happened so i i kind of went into it in some ways of like trying to combine as many different art forms as possible that I felt that I was, like, okay at, if not great. And if I sort of, like, mash as many things together as I can, I can eventually come out with something that's both, like, unique and good for what it is. So I would do things like paint poetry onto clothing that I thought was good. So I was trying to combine, like, writing, painting, and fashion neither of like none of which i'm like actually good at like i'm a shitty poet <laughs> i'm a, i'm a decent painter yeah. and i can make pretty good outfits i'm a little better now than i was back then but you know like it was just sort of like a way to hide my own insecurity about each of the art forms essentially yeah. no nah, that that's a really cool way cuz like i that's something i can definitely relate to like as a kid just being in art classes and stuff i was never like the artistic type and like I would try doing things, but it would never come out as good as I thought. And then, you know, you see like all just 
obviously going to museums you see a much higher level but just in my class alone like i'm seeing all these kids around me drawing such beautiful things that i'm like yeah man i shouldn't even try this anymore like yeah like and like even in like like you know even outside of like the exalted museums like just going to art shows in the city and seeing how like well people were dressed and how good people were at like painting or writing it was it, you know like a lot of this is just sort of like internal irrational self-doubt but a feeling of like i'll never get there just focusing on this so i want to try and like do everything i can become a bit of a jack of all trades um whether or not it was like rational to dislike my own art that much at that point it was a good way to get myself to try it by like putting it under the guise of other things at the same time Nah, and I also like that approach because, like, by trying everything, you get to experiment and, like, find your own style in all those things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, like I, I got to figure out how to paint clothing at the same time I was figuring out how to write. You know, it, it, it was, uh, it was like, it's sort of inadvertently creating this really efficient time of, like, learning and practice of, of trying all these things simultaneously, failing at all of them, and then getting better at all of them at yeah. the same time. Trial and error. Yeah. So building off of that and going back to, you know, your brand and everything, we know you have a pop up shop coming up this uh is it this weekend or is it next weekend? No, next weekend, May eighteenth, Saturday. At social status. Social status downtown. Fuck with me. Uh yeah. So you're gonna be selling these painted converse, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna be selling uh I have Five pairs of those painted Converse, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 in men's size. But you can also custom order them from me, all that shit. And I'm going to be having various other offerings as well, shirts, hats, that kind of deal. But yeah, come down, say hi, or buy something. I will. I'll, de I'll definitely <laughs> stop by. Social status, May 18th, man. Yeah. 12 to 5, stop by. But um, then... Going back to last week, or was it two weeks ago? I can't even remember, but Wilkins Block Party. That was two weeks ago, yeah. Two weeks ago. So, yeah, you had a booth over there? Yeah, that was, yo, that was a fucking blast, man. Yeah, let's we'll, we'll hear a little a bit time. about that. Uh, so, I, I was selling under uh, Wicked Pittsburgh. I'm, like, a member of their artist roster. They're an artist, art collective within the city. Uh, excuse me. And uh, they offered me a space for my booth to sell there, because I've done, like, vending of that type before, but I'd been out of the game in that regard for a little bit. I'd mostly been like selling online, but it's a really like those type of vending events are, are perfect for, uh, utilizing like all of that practice time where it's like, you make like 20 shirts that aren't necessarily as good as like gallery level material, yeah. but they aren't bad. So you can like take them there and like sell them for a slightly lower price to a festival crowd and stuff like that. And in general, just like, get to hang out among all of these other artists. You know, there's so many other, like, really awesome people there. Ooh Baby is there. Zach yeah. Rudder is there. You know, like, so many great artists. So, so, yeah, it was a really, really fun environment to be in. Shout out to Emma, my manager. She was She's a great salesperson. She definitely helped me, like, get some clothes out the door that day for sure. Nah, yeah, there was a lot of love. I saw mad people rocking your clothes around. I was wearing my Lavin Color jacket out yeah, there. Yeah, I, I saw the Lavin Color jacket in the crowd. I was like, fuck. It was, it was really wild. It's still, like, weird to see people in my clothes. Because, like, I've, you know, I've been, like, selling clothes for almost three years now. So, yeah. like, there's a decent amount of people that own my clothes. But I just never, like, once I sell it, I don't, like, think of them wearing it after that. So then I'll see someone a year down the line and be like, oh, fuck. I made like, that. <laughs> yeah, like, shit, I made that. Like, I was just at, at, at Britney Chantel's, like, album release show. I, like, rolled up, and there was someone walking in in one of my jackets, and I was like, oh, shit, I made that. And they were like, oh, I bought this at, like, Three Pigs. And I was like, yeah, I made that. That's crazy. And, it, yeah, it's so wild. And that, that day was definitely the epitome of that feeling. And it's really cool that you get to, like, just, like, as you mentioned, meet other artists, but definitely just meet other people and just, like, expose yourself to, like, you know, the normal people that are walking around that like to appreciate this art. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, it, you know, it's it's just a, like, it's a good way to to actually tell people what you're about, 100%. you know? Like, they, they walk up and they're like, oh, painted clothes, that's cool. And you're like, yeah, like, this is what I do. This is how I make it durable. Like, you know, let me share my process with you and stuff like that. So, it, yeah, it's, it's very, um, it, it's a very, like, self-affirming experience to be able to put yourself out there like that, for sure. And then just, like, how have you built this brand up to what it is now? Or, like, you know, your your clothes in general? Because I will say you're doing 
pretty well right now. I've seen a lot in Pittsburgh, man. Thank you. Uh, honestly, not a, not a clue. I don't know what what has happened, but uh, I mean, like, I don't know. I guess just like working a lot. Like I, you know, I spent two years focusing more on practicing what I was doing than making money off of it. Um, one of the biggest things I would say that I've done is just taking like really dumb opportunities that I wasn't necessarily ready for and just trying to see what I could do with them. Um, like for example, last summer, Senseless, one of my other favorite vintage stores in the city, yeah. they hit me up and were like, hey, do you think you could customize some shoes? And I was like, yeah, I paint shoes here and there. And they were like, no, we want you to like take leather off of them and put other leather on. And I was like, I've never done that before. Yeah. But yes, yeah, I'll try it. And it was terrible. I mean, like the shoes turned out okay, but it was like a lot of work. I didn't know what I was doing. I fucked up a lot. There was like a lot of times where they were like, hey, you gotta, you gotta like fix this part of it yeah. or something like that. But now I, you know, a like got that opportunity to like customize shoes for senseless and learn how to do a yeah. totally new thing that I hadn't learned how to do before. Um, so just like a lot of classic like nose to the grindstone shit, you know, just like going home and painting for hours every day missing social events to paint every day, stuff like that. And not even with the mindset that you're going to sell, but just somewhere down the line, the sales started coming. It's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, like that's a really good approach. I feel like you really want to master it for what it is, not just monetize it. Right yeah, now. yeah. I mean, it, there, I feel like there's a, a, a delicate balance in terms yeah. of, like, monetizing your art where there's a lot of pressure to sort of, like, jump into the deep end and just, like, fuck it, quit your job, do this all full time, which, like, no, you know, like if you're doing that, hell yeah. Power like you have you, a yeah. lot more bravery than me yeah. and I really hope it works out. But it, it, at least for me personally, I feel like there can often be a lot of pressure to like negatively monetize one's art if you're doing that because immediately you have to make money off of your art. Yeah. So it's like very quickly you can run into situations of like, do I cheapen my art for more money? Do I do what is integral for less money, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a lot of like, you know, keeping a day job, coming home and painting during the night, getting keeping your integrity as an artist. And yeah. Not, yeah. Not like, like figuring that. out what I actually wanted to make. Yeah. And then once I figured out what I actually wanted to make, trying to get that into a position where I could make it for money, essentially. And, you know, I'm, st I'm starting to get there and it's pretty, pretty wild. All right. So while we b build that up. And, you know, obviously much more room for building up in the future. Who is one famous person that you would love to see rock your stuff? Oh, that's a good question. I didn't read that on the outline. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> I should have been ready for that. Uh, oh, one famous person. Either Ezra Miller. I really like Ezra Miller. Yeah. Uh, or... No name. Ezra Miller or no name. That would yeah, that would be a crazy honor. Which I mean, like, no no name's famous. Yeah. Right? I, I, would, I think he's popping off right now. Yeah, I I would categorize her as famous. Yeah. But yeah, one of those two. For sure. And then um where do you see your brand going? Or where would you like to be at? Where ideally? Cause I know this is a difficult That's question. That's a big to question. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> a difficult question. Um I mean like I don't I don't necessarily have, like, specific overarching goals for my brand. I'm not, like, trying to take over the world of fashion yeah. or anything like that. I mean, one thing that I definitely want to do is not stop painting clothes. Because, you know, like, it, if you, it, like, if I'm able to, like, achieve a certain level of, like, notoriety or, or whatever and start, like, selling just, like, printed clothing and stuff like that of my painted designs, that would be tight and probably make me more money. But I, you know, I, I, in many ways, I just kind of want to keep doing what I'm doing and keep developing that to a larger level. Um, especially like this, this year, being able to work on larger scale projects where I'm creating 
not just one-off pieces of things that I think look good or like, oh, this is a fun pattern and good colors, people might like it, but making a full-formed project that's cohesive within itself and, and um, you know, presents a consistent artistic idea, that's more so what I want to do. So creating painted collections, I suppose, without uh, overbalancing my, my brand or whatever it is towards heavily produced or mass produced and like commercialized clothing. I feel that and I respect it. Yeah. So with that said, we'll end this section here and I hope y'all enjoyed that section two. We're going to head to break real quick where we got another beat and um, yeah, stay around. We got some more interesting stuff coming up. Yeah. When we make music, we don't do it in order to reach a certain point, such as the end of the composition. If that were the purpose of music, to get to the end of the piece, then obviously the fastest players would be the best. So likewise, when we're dancing, we are not aiming to arrive at a particular place on the floor as we would be in a particular journey. When we dance, the journey itself is the point. When we play music, the playing itself is the point. And exactly the same thing is true. Meditation is the discovery that the point of life is always arriving. was whenever I started wearing more feminine clothing that I sort of knew I wasn't supposed to wear. Uh, you know that like negativity and like negative comments and stuff like that are going to come towards you eventually yeah. because of that. So there was a lot of motivation to dress really well so that if I was going to get criticism for say wearing a dress, the criticism couldn't come from my outfit being bad. The criticism could only be from me wearing a dress. Yeah. Sort of as a as a way to like unmask the reasoning behind that. Um, and I feel like it would build like just like personal confidence in wearing those outfits out. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. Like there's there's a lot of you know like if you've never worn a dress before and most of society sees you as a man, then it's like if you're gonna wear a dress, you better wear a dress. You know, you can't just like 
throw it on because you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And, you know, then you're just sort of like playing dress up and shit like that. Like, you got to come correct if you're going to do this. Come correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I love clothes and I love the way that clothing inherently affects the way that you present yourself to society and you know that the clothing you wear affects the way that society will react and um, act towards you, essentially. Do you think there's a change that's starting to happen right now? Because I kind of... Yeah, 100%. You, like, with painting clothes, and then I, I see a lot of sort of... I, like, celebrities, I guess, are the ones who are, I'm seeing a lot doing this, but, like, breaking down kind of the, like, the two distinct, like, the male yeah. look and the female look. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of that start to break down. Yeah, it's, it's getting there. There's, you know, there's a lot of work to do. And I mean, in, in some ways that work will like never end, you know, like it, it, there, there's a lot of uh, stark contrasts within the, the boundaries that you're allowed to wear certain clothes. You know, like if I go to most spaces that I enjoy going in this city, you know, if I'm going to an art show, if I'm going to First Friday, if I'm going to Boom Concepts or, you know, any, anywhere like that or going to a show and I'm wearing a dress, like nobody's nobody's giving me a problem. Yeah. There's a bunch of other queer people there, you know, like. Like, the, it, it's it's a really easy space to be in and, and really, like, pleasant. But if you wear a dress and you go out on the south side on a Friday or Saturday night, you're going to get some shit. Yeah. And you know that that's going to happen. But overall, I would say that there is a, a lot of positive change happening within society, specifically around the realm of clothing and, um, you know, like, gender acceptance, uh, gender normality and conformity and stuff like that. Yeah, there there's... um. In general, I would say there's a much more positive curve happening than a negative curve, for sure. That's good to hear. Yeah. It's, I always like moving forward, always like progression, so. Exactly. And because, like, clothes are beautiful. Yeah. And they're just clothes. Like, like you know, it's it's tight to be able to wear, like, a more queer outfit and, and be able to exemplify that you're queer. But it's also tight that to to have the idea that anybody can wear anything and it does not matter. Whatever you want to look good in, however you want to look, wear it. It's all just fabric. Who gives a shit? We're I, animals. I We're really, all going to die. Yeah. Wear the dress. Like, We're all goofy as hell for wearing clothes anyway. Like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, like, like who cares? Yeah. No, nah, I really like what you said that clothes are clothes. And, like, yeah. basically it's this, like, societal impact that is giving, telling you that, like, you know, clothes belong, like, this clothes belong on this gender, that clothes belong on that gender. But I like what you said, clothes are clothes. Like, we can rock anything. So, like. Exactly. Exactly. I almost feel like the pantsuit kind of started to break that down, like w women entering the workplace and then they started yeah. wearing suits. Yeah, Th that was a very, very big thing in uh, even like back in like history, history, like women wearing pants was a huge yeah, deal and yeah. they would get like fucking murdered for it where it was like women never wear pants. You can't do this. And then like come late 1900s, it's OK for women to wear pants. I feel like in a lot of ways, that's kind of what is happening with men and dresses right now. Uh, is that like it's okay for people to wear dresses and you know like it, it's a slow process and like I said you know some spaces it'll be fine nobody will ever question you or like fuck with you for it and yeah. other spaces you'll feel like physically endangered for doing so but you know like that's you know we're at step one or two or three or whatever it is on the process but it's moving there shout out Yan Thug he was he was the first he, he's a he's a man that started wearing dresses and I was really? like oh shit it's okay to like be masculine and wear dresses. This is tight. Yeah. Breaking barriers, young thug. Pretty, exactly. Yeah, pretty cool. So just uh, moving on real quick, like, and actually going back to the beginning when we were talking about, um, you mentioned you were going through, like, you had some dressing phases in uh, high school, like some different. Yeah. <laughs> Let's touch on some of we those. All have them. We all have them. Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> Woo! Uh, <laughs> I mean, so... I, w I was in band in high school. I was like a marching band nerd yeah. uh, because I wasn't athletic. I did play volleyball for a year, actually. Yeah. Hudson's a volleyball player. Hey, yeah. yo, what position were uh, you? Right side. Yo, it's high. I was a center. Nice. Hell nice. yeah. Nice. Middle hitter, rather. Whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I in high school, I had like a, a three-way phase where I had a ska phase where I was wearing like checkered belts and like vans and shit every day. Then I had a dubstep phase where I was wearing like beanies and like electric blue Zoomies t-shirts every day. I was and close then, to that, though. Yeah, yeah we, were, we were all a little victims. Skrillex <laughs> was hard, you know? Like, still is, still is. Yeah, yeah. shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and then for some reason my senior year, I decided I wanted to be like fancy. And I started wearing suits to school. 
I would, I, I called it well-dressed Wednesdays, and I would wear a suit, a three-piece suit to school on Wednesdays, and it was fucking terrible. I have no idea how anybody tolerated me at that point, but... Did yeah, anyone else participate in Well Dressed Wednesday? A couple, yeah, a couple of my friends did. They would wear like dress shirts and a tie, yeah. but I would, I would like always try and like, even though I was like trying to get other people to dress well, I would always try and one up them and like dress like more fancy. Yeah, which like, you know, works out well today because now I'm like, oh, I'm gonna like come the best outfit for this, you know, like like it, it's a it's a it was a good base for my sense of like competitive fashion in some ways but very misguided at that point in time where I was wearing, like, old, like, 40s and 50s style suits and trying to look suave and shit, and I was just... Nah, I feel a, like... a, a skinny-ass high schooler. It was a bad time. <laughs> now, personally, like, as I mentioned, like, now I try and wear, like, people that, like, messages I support people, like, locally and even just, like, my favorite rappers and stuff. Like, I, I'd rather rep their stuff out than wear, like, name brands. But when I was little, little, like, elementary school, like, my mom used to get all my clothes, and she used to have me dressed on point. Like, I, I was definitely looking cute. <laughs> yeah, your, oh, your mom was like, we're going to get this picture yeah. right. <laughs> and then, like, I definitely, like, just, like, in general, like, college shirts, stuff like that, like, really nice. And then, like, I kind of got to middle school, and I was like, I can't wear this stuff anymore. Like, I don't, like, I don't like it. So then we went to JCPenney, got all those graphic tees, and, like, I used to get super big baggy tees for yeah. no reason. Oh, like, my God. Yo. <laughs> so my shorts are, like, capris, like, right here. Yo. And then my shirt's going down to my knees. <laughs> Did you, the, those ones with, like, like the, like, the vapory skulls going through them and, and shit. Like and, like, Oscar the Grouch and, yeah. like, Sesame oh Street God. and, like, stuff like Wait, that. Did you, did you have one of the, the Cookie Monster? Yeah, the oh one I seen that. That was, like, a classic mid to late 2000s fit right there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about that like when i look back on the pictures like i started dying every time i yeah. look because like there's such a big change between like what i dressed in middle school and high school like yeah middle school i was bucking <laughs> yep <laughs> but that's how it was for me because whenever I, I was growing up i was going to like a religious school so yeah. it was like we had a uniform you wore khakis and a polo every day and it sucked so then when i got to high school i was like wait what do i do like yeah. i don't know what i'm doing yet so i, I was just like trying random shit and then you know fell on something that I kind of liked and made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> did you like the fact that all about wearing a uniform or did you like hate that? I never even thought about it. Like, yeah. like at that point in my life, like, like, like the, the, like NFL street two that I was talking about yeah. that happened in like middle school ish. So whenever I was like growing up, fashion was never even a consideration. It was just like, you dress nice for church, and that means, like, a button-up shirt and some pants, and you wear your uniform for school. But, like, it was never, there was never any personal style. There was never any, like, you're expressing yourself through your clothes. Yeah. So it was a really, really new concept once I got there. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I didn't really enjoy it or not enjoy it necessarily. It was just what it was. Nah, I feel it. So um, how do you go about finding clothes now, like? Um, picking out your clothes, stuff that's not your own, obviously. But, yeah, like, yeah. I mean, like, a variety of ways. Like, stuff that is my own, even. I mean, I, I get a lot of shit from thrift stores. Yeah. They're, like, that's, that's like, the the cheat code. Like, you can get amazing... Like, these pants I got from a thrift store, $2. Wow. Hell yeah. Those like, are like, <laughs> yeah. yeah like, like, sparkles on them. Those are, yeah, those are pretty fun. Right? Like, if you were to get even just, like, regular pants like this from a department store, like, yeah. 15 or $20 on sale, shit like that... So, like, thrift stores, vintage stores, almost never retail. I hate buying things retail. The mm -hmm. only things I buy retail are shoes. But even that, I'm trying to go to secondhand now. So, I, I try and buy pretty much everything I can secondhand. Um, or, like, responsibly sourced wholesale, pretty much. For, like, things that I'm trying to mass produce, like hats and stuff like that. But otherwise, like, this whole fit... I got these shoes from Threads on Carson, so those were retail. But, like, pants, shirt, headband, necklace, like, all of it is, like, secondhand as much as I can. Or vintage. Because, like, vintage, like, that's, like, I mean, we're, we're going into this in a second yeah. with fast fashion. But, like, vintage clothes, like, if you buy a Levi's jacket from 1980, that shit will still last you 25 years. If you buy a denim jacket from Forever 21 now for the same price or even more... 
it's only going to last you one or two years, yeah. you know? So, like, I would rather buy the clothes from the era when they were actually produced well anyways and not support an immoral fashion industry at the same time. So while we're touching on that, let's get into fast fashion. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, can you just uh, explain to everyone and myself what fast fashion is? So, I mean, like, fast fashion isn't necessarily a technical term. Like, yeah. it isn't, it is, there aren't, like, specific parameters for it. But essentially, it is the, uh, like, business of very, very easy to acquire and not very durable clothing. So you're thinking stores like H&M, yeah. Zara, Forever 21. Honestly, pretty much most stores in the mall are yeah. fast fashion. They'll just change their price points. But, but like, most places are using low-grade manufacturing techniques and also, like, underpaying and exploiting their labor as well. So it's it's essentially the rotation of clothing and the clothing market away from... Uh, like utility and and durability and towards very very fast trend building and um, quick like production and rollout cycles so like forever so I worked for for, for forever 21 like I was saying yeah and they're I think the epitome of fast fashion either them or like like them H&M and Zara I think are like the big three of fast fashion and like fashion Nova I suppose where the whole business plan is identify a trend about two or three months before it becomes Huge. a large enough trend yeah. To, yeah to like sell a lot of clothes produce as many pieces of clothing within that trend and then sell them within three months and then catch on to the next trend within three months which is like kind of where the entire fashion industry has been trending towards since like the 1980s or 90s yeah uh but it's kind of coming to fruition now where you know, it, it's like the McDonald's of clothes, pretty much. Nothing is made well. Nothing is made with good materials. Yeah. Nothing is made ethically or sourced well or, like, sustainable in any way. And you're not even getting that good of clothes out of it. Like, McDonald's, nobody's is, is like, this oh, is I need a great <laughs> yeah. meal. Let's go to McDonald's. Yeah. You're, like, going to McDonald's because you're, like, fucking high or you're, like... I got five bucks. Let's yeah. go. You know, like, like that's what forever 21 is where you're like, I needed, I need a fit for this party. I got 35 bucks. Let's go. And you could probably get a fit for 35 bucks, but it's like, it's, it's literally the worst, all of the worst aspects of the clothing industry rolled into one thing. It's impassionate. There's no artistic integrity in forever 21. Yeah. You know, they, they, like, it's just created by a marketing team that figures out what people might think is hot in a month and then roll out that and then produce it as cheaply as possible and sell it as much as they can. And, um, yeah, it's, it's soulless and I hate it. And it's everything fashion shouldn't be, which is why I love vintage because I, I feel like vintage is much more so what fashion should be. I mean, there's, you know, there's problems within the fashion or within the uh, vintage industry, but they're much, much less uh, pronounced than like the retail fashion industry but one of the things like i hadn't even thought about was that like what you said was that you know denim jackets back back in the day were produced much at higher quality and like those things were better produced at that time so like yeah it makes a lot of sense to buy things from that time like rather than get it made today you know yeah exactly like like uh you know you buy something vintage and it and it will last you longer than a new product now which is 100%. like shameful but also that you know, like like the companies that are making the clothes now know that that's how it goes. People aren't gonna want the same clothes for two years or three years yeah. because you know, like one spring summer cycle, it's like wide leg jeans are the thing, and then the next spring summer cycle, it's like frilled uh, lace up tops are the thing. Are the thing so they can like they they're really good at like adapting to new trends, but they never add anything. It's just sort of like piecing together tiny different facets of clothing attaching it to things you know like lace up tops like they're cool but it's literally just putting a lace into a t-shirt yeah. that's already there and so they just do that to like 50,000 shirts and sell them and are like this is a new fashion trend and it's like it like and w which is which sucks because it just homogenizes and and uh like takes away any of the creative expression that comes yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, you, if you're wearing the same fit as 1,000 other people, yes, that's who exactly. gives a shit about your fit, you yeah. know? Like, like, yeah, people will see it and be like, oh, I know that that is good right now. You know, like, 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 
which sucks because trends don't have to be a bad thing for fashion. Trends are really cool. Yeah. You know, it's cool to see everybody like adopt a thing at the same time whenever it's organic, but whenever it's just sort of fed to people and, you know, a, a, a corporation that owns like 15 to 20 percent of the entire clothing market is just like, this is cool now. And everyone is like tight, skinny jeans ripped like skinny jeans this season the next season it's like moto jeans with a rip and everybody is wearing that like who gives a fuck i don't care about your outfit if it just looks like a forever 21 model i don't care Absolutely. and like that's the end goal of that industry essentially and it's very sad i walked yeah. into like i think it was h&m during black friday mm -hmm. oh my gosh it was it was horrifying, honestly. Like, I, I could only be in there for 10 minutes just because of the claustrophobia. But then yeah. on top of that, looking at the clothes, I, like, was pulling my friend away. He's like, no, I want to I get some joggers. I'm like, no, please, please do not. Like, yeah. This is not the place. And, and it, it, it's place. very sad because, like, it's, like, it's fine to want inexpensive clothing mm -hmm. and things like that. But there's other avenues to get that. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, a, like, there's other... Like, yeah, it, it, it's just sort of, like, preying upon the inherent... Uh, like laziness that's bred by whatever societal system we're in. You know, it, it's giving everybody the things they want as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible, and they know that they don't care about quality and they know that they don't care about the ethics going into it. 100%. You know, like if you look at any, any large fashion brand over the last 20 years, Gap, Old Navy, Forever 21, H&M, any of them, they've all been caught using sweatshops or slave labor 100%. within their production chains. And just nobody cares because if you're looking at two jackets and one's 15 and one's 25, everybody's going to buy the $15 100%. one. Yeah, and it's really, nice. really hard to get a whole population of consumers to collectively be like, I would rather buy a better $30 jacket than either of those and not directly support an industry that profits off of slave labor, yeah. essentially. But whenever those industries are making billions of dollars, it's really hard to fight them because they can out advertise you, they can out produce you, they can out style you. Anybody that had artistic, and you know, like when, it, like whenever I was getting into fashion, I was working at Forever 21, what was the plan? It was to, it was to move up and eventually get a corporate position. Yeah. Then what would I be doing? I would just be working to help Forever 21 get profits off of that same shitty ass system. So it's like, they can buy anybody that they want. You know, Fashion Nova can buy endorsements from anybody that they want. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's kind of sad because, like, how do you win, I don't know, eat the rich, dismantle capitalism, but, like, specifically within fashion, don't buy from Forever 21, y'all. Don't do it. I feel like people are getting a little bit more educated these days in their decisions. I, like, at least hope it's moving towards that. Like, personally, I've seen some people... But I just hope in general, like, it's moving more towards people getting educated where their clothes are coming from and what brands are the right brands to support and which yeah. ones are not. And just like Hudson, if you want to touch on this question, because um, you educated me before. Basically, after they mass produce these clothes and they don't sell all of the clothes, oh, yeah, then yeah, what yeah. happens to them? So, what, like, I learned about this in an environmental class. Yeah. Learning. And so what they do is, like, so they use horribly toxic dyes and chemicals and... God, the smell yeah. of Forever 21 boxes whenever, because like I worked sure. unpacking Forever 21 boxes for a while because I was mm -hmm. a floor manager. It is terrible. Fucking, uh, sorry, you can keep <laughs> no, going. No, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, so like the, the chemicals are awful. So they use horrible chemicals in third world countries and they like pollute the hell out of whatever river or groundwater it's going into. So that's bad. And then when all the clothes in like, let's say like your Forever 21 store had a bunch of unsold merchandise mm -hmm. you'd think like oh let's give it to a homeless shelter because people you know need it or let's actually make sure people who need clothes get the clothes but what they do and they do this with your electronic garbage as well actually all the phones you throw away i was talking with you about this yeah. a few days ago ad is they just pack it into like just crush it into boxes and then ship it to third world countries and they call it a donation because they're like oh we sent fifty thousand pounds of clothes over to ghana or something and now all these people have you know, bushels upon bushels of like millions of pounds of clothes just set in their like in their town, and they have to burn them or live with them. And they, like, oh, so they they have no distribution method. They just ship it. Yeah, they yeah. just ship it and drop it, and they're like, oh, it's a donation. We helped Africa, and so all those all of these clothing companies who say like if they even claim that they have charitable donations, the fact of the matter is is that they're not actually donating. They're just shipping their garbage there. Yeah, and even like even if people are donating, usually it's just a cost benefit analysis of yeah. how much do we donate that doesn't hurt our bottom line that still gives us a positive like 
public appearance, essentially. Yeah. So, like, it's all bullshit. They're all working against everybody. God, I fucking hate it, man. This yeah. is terrible. Because yeah. at least, like, if uh, a company at least donates for a tax break, if they if they're donating to a good cause, it's like okay. I mean, like you, like, like I don't somewhere. Yeah, you know? like you aren't actually integrally good, yeah. but at least you are inadvertently helping a good thing yeah. because you literally have to. But these guys are like, no, we're gonna still get a tax break, and we're gonna claim that we're helping people, but we're really just using them as a landfill and it's like it's and it, what what fucking sucks is that even if like say you like ship to an impoverished country and it's like 50 tons of clothes and everybody gets the clothes that they need from that and then burns the rest a you're polluting from burning the clothes and all the toxic 100%. chemicals b you're destroying any local fashion industry that's there i mean you know not like impoverished uh, countries have large fashion industries yeah. but there's like a uh, man i'm not necessarily educated enough on this to like give a a talk on it but like there is a a realistic problem of like donating large amounts of material goods to impoverished countries that just undercuts the economies like the local Mm -hmm. economies that people are trying to bring up because if you're trying to you know like make a living and and be able to uh you know like invest back into your city by starting a business and then the products that you want to sell from that business are just donated by some giant ass like forever 21 ass company then it just undercuts everything that you could possibly sell and there's no possibility for that money to stay circulating within mm-hmm. the country and benefit it so it's like these these companies are like making products in a terrible way that are destroying the countries they make them in and then they're selling it to people terrible products within the first world countries and marketing it to them in in bad ways and then the excess product, they're just taking it and destroying other local economies by donating it, donating it and polluting them more by making them burn it. Fuck Forever 21. Don't shop there, man. Don't shop <laughs> hey, there. Hey. I my clothes from now on. Yeah. <laughs> no, of course not. Like, I got some homies <laughs> that definitely have bought some stuff from there. So, like, shame, nah, I'm saying don't do that. Go return <laughs> that stuff yeah. right now. Like, and, I mean, and, I mean, like, it's not like, like you know, there's no ethical consumption under yeah. capitalism. So, like, it's not like it's it's possible to forever avoid buying from an immoral company because most companies are mo- are immoral but you know like whenever you can buy clothes from a th- from a thrift store buy clothes from a vintage store buy clothes from a local producer that sources their stuff well things like that spend your money on art instead of uh you know like really easily reproducible clothes and stuff like that you know there there's a lot of uh there's a lot of better ways to spend your money than getting a jogger for a party that nobody's going to give a shit about you know I think it comes from, like, you have to kind of, I'm just, like, thinking about this on the fly. So, like, localize capitalism in a way, if you know what I mean. Like, you if you localize it, because right now the world is so global, like, Forever 21 is a yeah. multinational company. But instead of people, like you were saying, went to your local thrift shop, your local, you know, artist who, who makes clothes or paints clothes and spent and gave them your money instead of just giving it to this faceless entity. Yeah. That's a way to combat it. I just don't know how you make that widespread. Yeah, it's it's really tricky because, like, one, one, once you sort of, it, it like, oh, man, this is a really large sociopolitical mm-hmm. discussion. But if you, like, scale down capitalism to just being, like, we'll support small capitalism, then once you support the small, like, I mean, A, shop at local businesses, support local definitely. businesses. Definitely. For the time being, that's definitely the best thing. But... Eventually, small businesses are going to become larger businesses, and then they'll just eat everything anyways. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know. Man. That's a... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Vote vote for for some good candidates or something like that. I I don't have the answers yet. (laughs) But as you mentioned, joggers, let's talk about um, some (laughs) trends. Something more lighthearted, I suppose. (laughs) Some trends that you don't like seeing and some trends that you do like seeing and like you know like obviously the trends keep changing every year yeah some things that have been here apparent during our our years yeah uh, that's hard because like like you said trends are always changing yeah. and like trends are like there's everything is in like some state of trend either it's like a large scale trend or a small scale trend whenever something is trendy for like the first adopters it could get like passe for them, but then it gets exploded onto a big market like that. So it's hard to exactly say where it's at. But I would say uh, trends not not necessarily that I don't like, but trends that I'm not impressed by anymore are hmm. 
I'm trying to figure out a yeah, way to like not. say anything without being mean to people. Uh, I, I, for full disclosure, I used to do this, but I think it's kind of lame to just wear fishnets underneath uh, ripped jeans or jean shorts. I don't know. That's not a crazy fit anymore. God bless you for that, honestly. Like, I, I needed someone to say that. Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 <laughs> like, I'll be clear. Whenever I did it, it was hard as fuck. But. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, like, 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 Rico Nasty has done that, like, 25 times, like, she, she has owned that section of it, don't keep trying to do it, it, it like, cause, like, well, it, it's not like, don't ever wear this, but there's a balance between, like, wearing something that's trendy, and just being, like, this is a good fit, and it's like, yeah, that fits well, you know, it works, like, everything's on board. But if you're wearing just, like, a trend that someone has given you, like, some celebrity did, and then you copied Rico Nasty and you wore this thing, and you're like, I'm changing the fucking fashion world. That's really lame. And, like, you know, I'm sure that I've done that before and I'm victim to it and stuff like that. But, like, I don't know. Whenever you're wearing trends, just be aware of what you're wearing and that you aren't necessarily changing the landscape of fashion. You're, you're just, just kind of hopping on the wave, yeah. Yeah, which is, like, cool. That's fine. You know, it's all right. But, you know. Just acknowledge that that's what it is. Yeah, don't get in your head too much. Personally, like, me and Hudson were talking about this before, and just, like, another trend, I guess, we'll yeah, mention yeah. is the, the ripped jeans, definitely. Like, so, back in the day when I said my mom was dressing me and everything, we used to go to Walmart, get the Wrangler jeans, you know, Ooh, mm -hmm. nice and cheap, like, $10, $15 a piece. Yep. And then... um over time, I started, you know, shopping for my own jeans, seeing seeing what's out there. And, like, I'm seeing people pull up with these ripped jeans. I still got my Walmart jeans on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're all like, I'm like, yo, how much did you pay for those jeans? And they're like, $50, $60. I'm like, whoa, like, bro, your jeans are ripped. There's less material. And you paid more for the jeans. Yeah, like, like, like that company is saving five cents on every jean because they're just cutting out material and repurposing it. Or and, like, doubling like the price, too. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, that was just one thing. But, like, I mean, today I understand ripped jeans. Like, even this jacket is distressed and everything. And, like, uh, one of my friends from back home actually made that jacket. And like, uh, like Yeah, like, it's fine. Yeah. It looks cool, you know? It's but... just something, like, I've never been used to wearing any bef uh, like yeah. anything with, like, rips before. Because, like, all the time my mom has been like, why would you buy something that's ripped? But then now that I finally wore it, I, like, understand it. And I'm like, yo, this is kind of, like, free. It's cool. Like, you know? Yeah, it gives you a little, like I was saying to you off air, I wear ripped jeans because in the summer... I don't like to wear shorts, yeah. so I like to wear pants, but I wear, I wear uh, pants that have big holes in them so I still get ventilation. So it's like, a, it's like a functional thing in some ways, or at least that's what I tell my family whenever they make fun of me for wearing ripped <laughs> jeans. Oh shit, I thought of a trend that I fucking hate, over branding or caring too much about brand matching. Like whenever people are like, oh, if you're wearing an Adidas hat, it's yeah. all gotta be Adidas. Or I like, that. yeah, man, this anti-social social club shirt is hella hard. Where it's like, I mean, like, I, you know, like, it's a t-shirt. I can't yeah. hate too much on it. But it's just like, I, I just cannot give a fuck about having a specific screen printed logo on your thing. Especially if it's not a particularly good screen printed logo. Like, and they're all guild and tees. Like, they're just... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like essentially, it's just a race of smaller fashion brands to see what the highest profit margin they can get. And they've all just been consistently surprised where they're like, oh, my God, production cost on this is like 850 and we can sell it for 350 This is nuts. Didn't Supreme make like a... This, like they had a sledgehammer that they painted red. Crowbar. Like, or crowbar, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, which, which like, crowbar. sadly is like kind of... Not sadly, necessarily... Because, like, Supreme, like, if you're, like, in marketing and advertising, they're, like, a testament. Like They're they, genius, yeah. yes. Yeah, they genius. nailed it. Like, like I can't, I like, that, the Supreme is almost so good, I can't hate yeah. on it. Because it's, like, holy shit, you're selling, like, mint containers for 80 bucks. And people will buy this, like, people are camping go, out. Like, y'all go ahead, you can, know? Yeah, I feel like they're kind of embracing the joke now. They're, like, hey, if people are going to buy it, like. Yeah, yeah, they're just, like, whatever, we'll make whatever. <laughs> but, uh simultaneously while i can respect them for getting their money as a brand yeah. i you know i won't respect someone for like rocking that it's not like oh that's a great fit like i i i got really into the whole like uh like fit check videos late, lately like there there was that one video on twitter of the girl in greece where it's like i got the antisocial social club and then like the yeezy calabasha sweatpants and the cartier earrings and shit like that where it's like how expensive is your fit yeah lame as fuck 100 percent. do not give a shit 
wow, you're really bad at this. Like, go, like, like at that point, go shop at Forever 21 because you're getting the same quality product, but you're just paying five times more and thinking it's hard. And, like, that's a disappointment. Because you dropped a bag on this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, exactly. Whenever it's like, like, every time I see that, I'm like, you give me $50 and the red, white, and blue on Sawmill Run Boulevard, and I could dress better than that. Like, that's embarrassing. So, yeah, I would say the relative, like, rate of, like, consumerism to fashion, that's a negative trend that I don't like much. So, just, like, something that came to mind real quick. This is, like, slightly related, slightly not a little funny story. So, the other day, I was uh, talking to my boy, Pray. He goes to Temple right now. And, um has this roommate um also went to my high school and ravinka shout out ravinka real quick but man was coming at me saying that my room is not decorated and everything you know like my walls are bland and everything and then i was like yo let me see your room and he literally had white walls everything and like if you know me i keep art <laughs> everywhere like even my room is definitely decorated very nicely like nobody is touching yeah, my this, decorations this corner like, is awesome i was just saying like how well it. well like cohesive it is and all that shit so, yeah, he was coming at me, and then I was like, all right, let me see your room. So then he shows me, like, the little FaceTime real quick. And this man bought a Bape t-shirt, like, a while ago. Oh, no. For some reason, felt the bag was so hard oh, that he had to no. hang it up on his wall and be like, yo, this is, like, the centerpiece of my room right here. <laughs> like, this is, I was like, man, you're just flexing, it's like, your brand that you yeah. bought, like, this is not even doing And, like, and, like it's brand. a bummer, because, like, Bape is cool. Like, Bape is a good yeah. brand. I respect Bape a lot. But... You know, like that, that in some ways, that's almost like the, the fate of like high fashion streetwear brands is the that they're at the, the yeah, like, value. like they're at the whim of their customers, you yeah. know, like if their customers are going to be lame as fuck flexing all their shit, then, you know, it like brings down the brand and it's like, dog, you're really flexing the bag, like the bag that's from it? Ravinka, yeah, come on, man. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Come on. Like. Like, go, like, literally, how, like, think of, like, break down the t-shirt. How much did the t-shirt cost? Probably 150 or so. The production cost of the t-shirt was probably 15 to $20 counting screen printing, maybe 25 to $30 counting shipping. The cost of the bag was probably 350 to $4 counting printing, maybe shipping. And then the rest of it was spent on, like, marketing and advertising and stuff like that. If you literally just went and spent... 50 to 75 dollars on a local artist you could get a cool ass commission piece to put up on your wall that's and fact. like what's harder being like look at this cool ass bag from a t-shirt i got or like yeah i put money in an artist's pocket from here yes and i got it on my wall now that's hard as fuck that is hard as fuck i like like i don't give a shit about the brands i want to try and get the money back into the pockets of the artists around here like, even building off that real quick, so, like, a normal thing that, I don't know how apparent it is in other cultures, but, like, definitely in the Indian community, like, your clothes matter status, like, right away. Like, you feel me? If you're not wearing name brands, then, like, what are you wearing? Like, people don't yeah, really care yeah. and stuff. So, like, a lot of the times, actually, like, at H&M and Forever, like, you know, um, Abercrombie and Fitch and all these places, you'll see, like, middle-aged Indian men shopping there and getting their t-shirts and stuff because, like, those are the name brands that they know about. But just... Yeah, I don't even know where I was going with that, actually. <laughs> but yeah, so it is like about the name brands and stuff, but just in general, like when I was saying like I wear like these things that are local artists, rappers and stuff like that, like, yeah, like a hundred other people might have that shirt, but only that hundred people that know what this shirt is are going to know. Like so many times I've went out and like people have seen like the rapper shirts that I like wear and stuff. And they'll be like, yo, that's a really cool shirt. Where'd you get that? And I was like, yo, it's my, the rapper's brand. Like, check it out. Like drops a whole bunch of dope stuff. But you guys don't even know about it because everyone's so focused on the name brands all the time. Yeah, exactly. And and like I, I feel like like sort of in in the same conversation of like trends and like inherently it's kind of uncool to wear things that other people are wearing. You know, like everybody wants to be you know separate from the yeah, pack and individual. Like it's okay to be wearing things that other people are wearing, but it, it you know like it's cool to do that whenever the thing that you're wearing has purpose and meaning. You know, like. If, if you show up to a yes. show and 100 people are in the same piece of merch, that's not lame. That's hard as fuck. Everyone showed out. Yeah, for yeah. the same cause. I feel that. That's definitely a good way of putting it. I exactly. Think. Which is, like, why it's so negative to see people dress in the same way from, like, fast fashion. Because it's, like, you're all uniting under message. this terrible shit. You could, you know, you could support, like, a good thing yeah. in a different way. Still, like, follow a trend and look the same as some other people. But, like, have it funnel money back into a good thing and support a good thing so yeah 
shout out to you for wearing all that fucking merch. Appreciate it. <laughs> you know, I just try and do my part. But like like you said, I definitely do like to like dress different. Yeah. But like I also, you know, respect the people that are supporting the good messages. That was a great way of putting it. So with that, we're going to cut to our next break right now. And I hope you guys enjoyed that section. A lot of deep cutting stuff right there. Yeah. Definitely need a breather real quick. <laughs> yeah, that was heavy. <laughs> so yeah, let's get this break and then we'll come back for section four. Final section.
just like as we were talking about in uh, the Conscious Kel podcast, like in the beginning, like it's final season, you know, like mental health, definitely keep that in check. So any person that has ever looked out for me personally, my mental health and like just checking up on me, they've done their part and they I feel eternally, eternally grateful to them for checking up on me. And I hope I could do the same when they're in times of need or Absolutely. just in general. Um, I would say one of the nicest things people have done for me One's is second. something just died. Huh? Nah, keep mm-hmm. going, keep going. You're good, you're good. Uh, Did you lose hearing? Oh, is your... Mike, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I'm oh, it kind of, oh, I'm so sorry. That's no my problem, fault. No problem, no problem. All good, audio check. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Technical difficulties. Uh, the nice things any, anyone has done for me is probably in the same vein, my girlfriend supporting me so much in uh, pursuing, like, better treatment for my own mental health, going to, like, a new therapist and getting in a new treatment program helped me a lot and she was really there for me along the way it's definitely very important to have a great support system behind you absolutely sorry i was doing some production stuff no it's uh, good powers. any weird quirks that are oh. uniquely yours oh, oh. i skipped that one we'll, we'll go back we'll go yeah, back. <laughs> we'll go back. yeah we'll weird go back. quirks first uh none that i can really think of um i can throw food in the air and catch it in my mouth really well like super high yeah, all like right, right. like I grew up with like blueberry bushes in my front yard, yeah. and you could throw them like 20, 30 feet in the air and still catch them. It took me a while to learn how to do that. Like, I just kept missing all the time, and then one day, I don't know, I just worked out the hit, that coordination, and I got it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. like once you, once you break the small barrier, you just have it forever. Superpower. What did the super... Oh, wait, no, I just... Did I just do that one? Did no. You know? no, you didn't oh, do no, that no. one. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Go ahead. <laughs> well, all right. So we, first we of all, I'm gonna answers. go. I'm gonna go back to the quirks oh, real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad, my I bad. Sorry, I got distracted. Yeah, no problem. No, my man Hudson is trying to handle all the audio technical. Yeah, he's got a needs. lot on yeah, his plate. Definitely. So uh, one of the things I do, and I, I won't even say it's that bad, but like I'm always like shaking my leg, and it's not even like I'm restless or anything. It's just like maybe it's it is because I'm restless. Yeah, but like, do you have ADHD? No, nah, I don't. Okay, because I have ADHD and yeah. I shake my leg all the time. It's like one of the symptoms. It's just like when, I don't know, maybe from like when I was young and playing football, like in, when you're in your stance, like you're always shaking your leg yeah, ready yeah. to go. And like, I don't know, even when I'm like taking notes or in a test or something, I'm going to start shaking my leg because like yeah. in my mind, it's like I'm ready to go. Yeah, it, fe- so it feels like, good. Like you want to yeah. be, you want to know that your leg works and yeah. you're like good to, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so now we'll, we'll go back to the superpowers. <laughs> yeah. hey, you could get... You uh, could my favorite superpower would definitely be long-range teleportation, 100%. Like, fuck anything else. Fuck flying. Fuck, like, time control. Any of that. No. Just, like, snap, you're in Italy. Snap. Like, I'm... Even just, like, snap, I'm in my friend's house across town. Don't have to deal with traffic. Yeah, that's... None of that shit. No commute ever. Perfect. That's not a bad answer. I think, all right, so, like, if I was in high school and you asked me this question, I would have said elasticity. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, obviously I was an athlete. And, like, so, you, so you can get taller. Never, yeah, yeah no, because, like, one thing, yeah, I'm definitely, like, short and, like, size has always been a thing in sports. So I was mm-hmm. like, you know, if you're elastic, you're just going to reach up 10 feet in the air. It doesn't even matter. Nobody's guarding you. Like, dunking goal on everybody. Goal-oriented. Like, the goal-oriented. Yeah. <laughs> but now, today, I would say, like, I think flying would be really cool, but I also think that uh, invisibility would be tough. But, like, you can yeah. spy on people. Nah, I mean... More so, I feel like invisibility, at least for me, would be, like, be in a social situation that you're anxious in, and you don't have to talk to anybody. You're just, like, you know, like, you're at a show, and you're, like, I don't want to talk to anyone, I just want to watch the show. Then you're invisible. Real G's move in silence, so you know. (laughs) Invisible. Yeah, that's all. That's all That's all we got? Yeah. I hope y'all enjoyed this conversation today because we sure did. We had a great time chilling today yeah. in the Live and Color studio with the podcast here with Stu Frick. Hello. Make sure you follow him on Instagram mm-hmm. and Twitter if you want to shout those out real yeah, quick. Yeah, my Instagram is at Stu, like Stu, like the soup, like thick soup, S-T-W underscore Frick, like the park. My Twitter is at Stu dash Frick, not underscore. So Instagram is an underscore. Twitter is a dash. Uh, you can find my website at sweettoothcustomization.com. Uh, and if you want anything customized, painted, anything like that, you just let me know. Hit me up on any of the DMs in any of those profiles or email me at sweettoothcustomization at gmail.com. That's it. So as, as you said, he's a great dude to work with. And definitely just hit him up if you need anything. And um, again, reminding you that jacket right there, I'm going to be rocking that a lot in the future. Super tough. And just make sure you show in love. 
following everything, make sure you follow our Instagram, Live and Color Media, our Twitter, it's Live and Color. Make sure you subscribe, drop a like, drop a comment, and you know, just interact with us. Let us know what you think. Cause we definitely touched on some good topics today. I really think it was a very enriching conversation. Yeah. So it was a great time having you here today, Stu. I really appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you for having me. No problem, man. And with that here <laughs> with that said, <laughs> we're gonna cut to this last song right here. Boogie one time. It's a gem. So we're gonna get lit. Just rock, if you ever stuff money in your sock I said just roll, if you glad you ain't back on the block We think about stocks now, and the bars I don't come with a lockdown The driving G cars with a drop style I'm making mom and pops proud, cause I was a hot style, uh But you gotta crawl the walk, hit my prime became an autobot Now I call the shots, serve the pot and serve the broth You get what you weren't, that's all, then that's on the bra This world we in don't make you strong, if you don't you won't be long Patience thinner than a thong, smoke you niggas in the barn let me see it one, two times if you're good Three, four times if you're great Five, six times if it took a long time 97 cause it's never too late Let me see it eight times if you grind Let me see nine if it's fake Let me see ten cause the whole team win Everyone that played a part need a plate Personally, I got beef with y'all. Sit down, got it to brief you all about some things I saw. My aunt Chloe, that was first of all. Gold kings and the swordsman horde. I done open sword through the plane, like my soul had strength. Strapped up for them brazen days. Ain't got time to be good, only space to be great. Honestly, I'm on time, but I'm five minutes late. I cascade through the hills on I 78. Bags that I sniffed will be the bags I make. Try to feed the vultures, but they already ate. Checked on my dogs, but they already straight. Come on, son. Your whole life, ass and dollars, goofy, stupid, smoochy wallets, fiend for days and never strayed from my path. They did myself to overcome all that stand. Like, there we go, who that man? Grief for process, white like a cool ice stand. And I break this nigga, poop that man in a black hood like the reverse of the Ku Klux Klan. I gotta. Boogie with me. Let me see it one, two times if you're good. Three, four times if you're great. Five, six times if you took a long time. 97, cause it's never too late. Let me see it eight times if you grind. Let me see nine if it's fake. Let me see ten, cause the whole team win. Everyone I played a part, need a play. Let me see one, two times if you're good. Three, four times if you're great. Five, six times if it took a long time. 97, cause it's never too late. Let me see it eight times if you grind. Let me see nine if it's fake. Let me see ten, cause the whole team win. Everyone I play the part, need a play. Gotta be on guard in the way. Too many niggas ended up lost out of place. Cut a couple off that was partners with Jake. Losses you take our guitars to the game. Roll it back with that's a side to the brain. Of opposite pain. To get back on offense and change. Just pop in the game. I never can follow the grain. There's no need to talk or explain. Truly in the booty, limping like I tweak the ankle. Meet your maker, make the table, feed the people. We all thankful. Know it's love, but we all hate you. Pencil banging like beats on table. County visits. Seats on table. Did your deed and now you home, but shit ain't changing. No more love and no more hugs and no more drugs. He sobered up. At least I hope if he tweak again, it's gonna really fuck me up. But love is love and loyalty is what? Think I care, but I don't give a fuck. Pearly rolling till my time is up. Thought I beat it till they line me up. Niggas know who you remind me of? Some son of a whore, grimy fuck. Honestly, you better give it up.